not fully preach. I'm going to right? Brilliant. Good. Anything else? One more? No? Okay. But just, yeah, just keep us in your prayers and also for our candidate. And what else? I think that is it. Oh, no, Sue. Yes, Sue. Yeah, I knew there was something. Um, Sue's going to come and give us a notice on Romania and is it message of the Sorry about that.
Where would you find that? Say two to lots of twelve. Look at the last of the Bible, maybe. Revelation, 24 elders. Yeah, okay. I'm moving swiftly on. I've lost you all. I can see that. So, anyway, um, so you've got the 12 tribes. But you've got to consider that did Abraham see what God promised? He didn't, did he? It's 500 years, probably, between the time God promises this land to Abraham and his descendants. The one thing you need to know is sometimes God will promise something, but it may not even happen in my generation. I used to find that really annoying. I thought, actually, I'd really like to be around when Jesus comes back. Does anybody like to be around when Jesus comes back? One or two. <laughs> There's all sorts of exciting stuff going to happen then, and some of it isn't that pleasant either. But, actually, I just wanted everything to happen in my lifetime, so that I could experience it and see it. But the reality is, God sometimes does things down to generations. Not in my time. He might reveal something to you which isn't for you. It's actually for later on, down your family line even. It's possible that it happens that way. So, I don't know, have you ever been excited? Is anybody here excited about Christmas? Not really. Oh, yes, there are some people who are excited about Christmas. Um, a few people are excited about Christmas. And do you think the Israelites, after being promised for about 500 years that they were going to go into this land, they actually are going in? After, after all this time, after messing around in the wilderness for 40 years, all of those things, they actually are going to take the land that God promised. I think it was daunting and yet incredibly exciting to be part of a promise that God had given all those years ago and kept on promising. And then suddenly you're in this place and you experience the fulfillment of that promise. It would have been amazing to be part of something like that. I want to talk a bit about the promises of God. And I'm going to be honest with you, sometimes we as Christians not always use the promises of God very wisely. Okay? And we'll talk about that as well. So the promises of God, I've got a few bits here. So the promises of God, I would call them initially unilateral promises. Now that's a big word to use on a Sunday morning when it's called. So unilateral, what does that mean? It means that, say for instance, you know, um, a unilateral promise would be God says this is going to happen and it happens. That's, he does it, it happens. There's nothing I can do to stop what he's going to do because it's just going to happen. It's unilateral. It's like they use the word in disarmament, that a unilateral disarmament would, would be a country says, I'm going to give up nuclear weapons regardless of what anybody else does. That's unilateral. So unilateral promises of God. Now, I'm not going to be cruel. I'm not going to say what these are. But let's have a look at some other promises. We'll do this in a minute. Conditional promises. Conditional promises. If you do this, then I'll do that. So, I could say to Sue, my lovely wife, I could say, if I buy you a new jumper, would you make me a really special meal? You know, that's it. No. The answer is no. But, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but, there are, but there's a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of conditional promises in the Bible. And you and I need to know which ones are unilateral and which ones are conditional. And then another part of this is where prophecy and promise get mixed up. Prophecy and promise. And you'll see quite a lot of times when a promise is given in a prophetic manner for things which are about to happen. And we won't spend a lot of time on that, but we'll come to it. So, let's start with this. Let's find an example. I, I found them for you. I'm not going to ask you to look them up and find all these for me, which is quite helpful. So, the first one I want to just have a look at is 
this is fairly typical in some ways from Genesis. You know, it's not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. That, that is God just saying, I'm going to do this. I'm saying this is a statement that God says. He's made lots of statements which become true in the Bible. There are quite a few others. Um, let's, let's find something which is the New Testament, which I think is probably easy to look at. So, here's one from Matthew 16. For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with the angels, and he will reward each person according to what they've done. So this has got both in there, in a way, hasn't it? The first part is saying that the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels. End of. There's nothing you can do about that. Listen, you can't put your hand up and say, that's not going to happen. <laughs> it's, it's just, it's going to happen. It's a promise. It's, the Son of Man is going to come. That is a promise which we can totally rely on and is totally independent of what we do. But the reward, that's more conditional, isn't it? Because it depends on what you've done, and there's many other things as well, which we'll talk about later. So just to say that promises of God can be given to a person, a people group, and it can be, say, about something. You can have a promise about things as well. Now, we're in um, a season of Advent, and Advent means, you know, is to write the Latin word Adventus, meaning a coming, which is tra the translation in the Greek is Parousia. And often you'll hear the word Parousia mentioned in Christian circles. Again, it means either coming or second coming. That's what this means for you, the word Parousia, that's what it's been. Often in Christian circles it's more about the second coming. And, you know, a promise is, can have a lot of hope in it. It can give you hope. And the promise of Jesus coming is amazing, because he's going to come again, but he's already come. And as we said earlier, are we looking forward to the second coming of Christ? And we're meant to be praying as Christians, actually, come soon. Come soon, Lord. Here's a well-known scripture, and quite apt for this time of year. For, for, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace that we know end, he will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on. And forever, the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. So, Isaiah is empowered by God through His Spirit to prophesy and promise. So, it is actually this is what He's going to do. But it's a beautiful picture, isn't it, of what God is going to do. Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. How amazing is that? What a wonderful promise. And, you know, we all need to remind you as Christians that this Christmas, as we're preparing, as we're sort of purchasing things for Christmas, let's make sure that we go back to this and think about the birth of Jesus. And as a church, obviously, we'll be doing things to help us do that. But it's so easy to get wrapped up in what? The world is doing. I want to um, look at conditional promises, and this is an area which is it can be quite difficult to discern exactly how we should understand these things. Some of them are very simple, some of them not. So, here's one from Joshua: Have I not commanded you be strong and courageous? Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord will be with you wherever you go. So let's unpack this. Anybody want to tell me 
what the conditional part is. What's the part that we have to do, or the Israelites had to do at this time? Anybody want to just shout it out? Do not be afraid, do not be afraid. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, so don't be afraid. That's the condition. Or be discouraged. Yeah, absolutely. So these are conditional promises. Let's try another one. He was seated on the throne and said, I am making every, every, everything new. Does everybody agree with that? You shouldn't do it because I put it deliberately there to confuse people. Because that is a unilateral promise. It is, isn't it? The only reason I'm doing that, I'm not trying to trick you. I just want you, when you read the Bible, to ask the right question. What is, it, what is God saying through this promise to me, to our church, to my family? How do I interpret this? And so that one from Revelation is a unilateral promise. It's a great one. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Anybody here want eternal life? Yeah. Oh, there's two, three, four. Oh, God, there's quite a few people who are quite good people. I just, just want to check who I'm speaking to you. That's good. <laughs> so eternal life is something that you and I really want to be part of. We want to live forever with God, with Jesus, don't we? And it's going to be absolutely incredible. Absolutely amazing. More than any of us could imagine. But it's conditional. And in here, what is the conditional phrase? <clears throat> Whoever believes. So this is conditional stuff. Is that one from Matthew eleven twenty eight? Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Is anybody a bit busy at the moment? A bit frantic? Some people have said, no, no, it's just, life is just so easy. It's just all happening as it should. There's no stress or anxiety in my life whatsoever. And others are thinking, oh my goodness, how am I going to get through the next week or let alone the next day? Because I have a lot of in my life. So what does Jesus say? So this is condition you can have the rest that God's part of saying here. And we've got to take our yoke upon and learn from him. You learn from him. And then you'll find the rest of yourselves. I hope you get the sort of general gist. It's just how you look at scripture and see if there's a promise for him. And how you get that promise is a part of our God. And uh, one from Joshua, which I think is just lovely. Uh, it says here, the Lord gave them rest on every side, just as he swore to their ancestors. Not one of the enemies who stood them, the Lord gave all their enemies into their hands. Not one of the Lord's good promises to Israel failed. Everyone was satisfied. Not one of the Lord's good promises of to his red found every one of them was fulfilled. Amazing stuff. So here's another question. Can we use Old Testament Bible promises to apply to us today? says, uh, therefore, since we have these promises, dear friends, let us purify ourselves for everything, from everything that contaminates body and spirit, perfected holiness out of rivers for God. So when you look into the New Testament, you'll see that the New Testament writers often will actually refer to the promises in the Old Testament. 
So, you know, we've got a bit of a mandate there. There's some other ones which we could quickly look at in this sort of area. And here's a typical sort of way of looking at this. Have a look at this one from Isaiah 41. Is there an encouraging scripture? If you were having a bit of a bad day, is that the sort of thing if a friend finds you up or texts you and says, This is a scripture? And would you feel encouraged by it? And I think we probably would. But what I want you to do when somebody does that, I want you to look at it in context. If you look at it in context, there it is. So, primarily, when this was written, it was to the Israelites. And what we do as Christians is we steal parts of the Bible and apply it to ourselves. Okay? So we take these promises which were made specifically for Israel and we apply it to ourselves. Is that wrong? Or is that okay? Answers. Can we say that? Perhaps I don't know. I think what I'd like to say is be careful to make sure you know the original context of Scripture, which is for, for encouragement. Make sure you've looked at the beyond it, you know, before it, and understood where it's coming from. It's just really important to do that. But here's an example, just to give you some encouragement. So in, in Romans, so Paul writes this, and he says, "Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved." Amen. Amen. Conditional promise. Everyone who calls on that. Yep. Well, actually, Paul didn't write this. This, is, this comes from Joel. So he's used part of the Old Testament, shoved it into the New Testament, and he said, this is a promise, which is from the Old Testament, which applies today. And so there was a continuity of the love and the promises of God which do come through the Old Testament into the New and into our lives. So I think we can use them, but I just say, look at these and make sure and check them out where they've come from and who the original person or group it was meant for when it comes to the promises of God. I think we can be almost a little bit flippant at times and not look at those things. So, You'll be pleased to know before you freeze to death that I'm coming to a conclusion. So, unilateral promises, those are the promises where actually God actually says it and it happens. We don't have any other response to it. We've got conditional promises where there's parts that we pray. And we've got prophecy and promises. Which is where you get that into the play, especially from Isaiah, you get loads of stuff. In Isaiah, we get prophecy and promise together. So, one thing um, I want to sort of say is there a promise that you need to keep as we finish here? Is this something you said you do for somebody else? Or you said it to God? Do you know those sort of things? God, if you do this, I'll do, I'll do what you want me to do. You know that sort of thing, you've heard people say that, you know, if you sort this out my life, I'll do what you want, that sort of promise. And make sure that you haven't got any of those sort of promises that you left, which haven't been fulfilled. Have you promised? And do you need to keep it? The other thing I when I was preparing this, I thought I'd say, is it a promise I've made, which I've broken? Which I haven't fulfilled? And do I need to apologise for that? And the other thing is prevarication. And what it means is, is if, you know, I think, actually I use the wrong word, I think it's more like procrastination, should I put in there? <laughs> so, what I was trying to say here is that there are times when what we actually do is we've said yes to God, but we haven't got it We've said yesterday, you know, it's like the story that Jesus tells in the parable about the two sons to go help him in the apple orchard. And one says yes and doesn't go, and the other one says no but does go. And I just wonder if there's something going on for you in that area. And I want to 
want to just finish on with this conditional promise. Okay. For God, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Let's just stand and pray as a finish here. Father, we just uh, own all of your promises. There are many promises for us in the Bible. Help us be discerning and understanding. And Lord, if there's anybody here who just isn't really sure about your love for them, I pray, Lord God, that you touch them by your Spirit now. Reveal your love to them. And that they will be to put trust and believe in you. And that they will have eternal life. Amen. Thank you.